This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Monday, the second day of September in the year 2019. Here's what we're tracking tonight. The pilot and crew of the tugboat that slammed into the Demerara Harbor Bridge early this morning, shifting it out of alignment and forcing its closure, have been taken into police custody and are facing questioning tonight. All of the crew members are believed to be Panamanian nationals. None of them speak English. Interpreters are assisting with the questioning. The Marara Harbor Bridge General Manager Ralston Adams told reporters this afternoon that the tug and barge were not booked to travel this morning, and from all appearances, the two were far from their anchoring point, which should have been in the Craig and Grove area. He explained that the tug and barge were heading in the northern direction, and it's unclear what caused them to drift into the bridge. The barge came into contact with the bridge at three, two locations, span 1213, and again at span 16. We saw some severe damages. You had a chance to look at it outside. The bridge is completely out of alignment between the high span and the retractor span. This morning, we were able to replace the connecting post at span 13. That was to facilitate us moving over to span 16, getting equipment over to span 16, we had to put in some temporary decking and we will be working at span 16 to reconnect the connecting posts. The repair work started early this morning but were suspended around noon today as the high tide came rushing in. Once the tide went back out, the work restarted. Just before the accident occurred, the pilot of the tug sent out a distress signal to the lighthouse, thereby activating an emergency. However, that signal was sent out just moments before the barge slammed into the bridge. Public Infrastructure Minister David Patterson. Well, it's drifting from about Diamond Grove, Diamond, apparently tomorrow. So it passed several vessels and, and, and wharfs, and they very late give us a they, they, they very late they give the Mayday, it's your name Mayday, it was received by the uh, lighthouse. lighthouse. Um, because obviously the, the captain or uh, crew could not speak English, the only words that they, they, we, they understood was Mayday, but they activated and the white lighthouse contacted the harbor master who immediately contacted the owner of a tug. This is just um, to come to, to the assistance. Um, but unfortunately, all of that was a bit late because they already would have come into contact with the, uh, with the bridge. A car that was traversing the bridge at the time of the crash got damaged as the plates shifted on the bridge, but there were no reports of any injury. Members of the media were taken on a site visit along the bridge this afternoon and given a first-hand look at the damage and the level of work that is underway. The management of the bridge is hoping that most of the repair works will be completed by early Tuesday morning to facilitate the reopening of the bridge to light traffic. They will provide another update to the media at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. More news coming up in just a moment. All across our nation, Guyana, we see it in your lives. The future growing even stronger. GPTI, all eyes on Guyana skies as the voices of our people rise again. Activate the GTT Fab 5 plan today. For only 5005 you get free unlimited calls to four of your closest family and friends, 5 gigs of data plus 250 text messages, and your Fab 5 friends can call you for free. 
GTT55. So who we put in as we pack by? Yes. Experience bliss in an exclusive atmosphere as Universe Boss Chris Gale celebrates his 40th birthday in Guyana. Yo. Batman out and stunting. Chris Gale can kick like dumpling. 40 Shades of Gale featuring Kess the band live and in concert. At the Arthur Chung Conference Center on Saturday, 5th October. Tickets three thousand dollars, general four thousand dollars, stage front ten thousand dollars. Forty shades of Gale. Party with the universe boss Chris Gale and a star studded cast of international cricketers. Forty shades of Gale featuring cast the band live and in concert at the Arthur Chung Conference Center on Saturday, 5th October. Welcome back. The Maritime Administration has given approval for speedboats traversing the Demerara River between Stabrook and Vreden Hoop to operate until 10 o'clock tonight. The move comes as repair works are ongoing to the Demerara Harbor Bridge following this morning's accident involving a tug and a barge. At a press conference this afternoon, Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson announced that temporary lights and other safety equipment will be deployed to facilitate the late night speedboat operation. We're after an assessment and, and, and uh, we're going to rent some portable lights and those things like that and put in some um, temporary navies. We're going to keep the water taxi service open until 10 p.m. tonight. The implications of that, and so I do hope that's why it's here, the implication of that is this, and, I, and I'd like you to communicate that after 10 p.m. this evening, unless you have an alternative method of crossing the river, you wouldn't be able to. Minister Patterson said additional police ranks and maritime officers will be at the two stellings to ensure safety. He also explained that there are 55 water taxis in operation and they have been operating in an efficient manner. He shut down suggestions of moving a ferry to the location, pointing out that the two stellings are not in a condition to allow any ferry operation. I know it's all that, that, that persons have already asked, um, but I would want to say unfortunately it is not possible for us to put a, a a ferry vessel back in operation. People have been ringing and asking why not reactivate the Freedom Hoop Stabrook um, ferry vessel. The condition of the stellings on both sides cannot accommodate a restarting of a, of a ferry vessel. So um, that's not possible. Both the Stabrook and Breeding Hoop stellings were put out of operation for ferry service more than 15 years ago. Patterson said there is now a waterfront project that will look at the rehabilitation of the two stellings, but that project is not expected to get on the way soon. Hundreds of commuters were forced to use the river taxi services this morning following the closure of the bridge because of the accident. That accident was caused by a tug and a barge slamming into the bridge. The high tides delayed some of the repair works for several hours. While the Ghana Elections Commission has revealed that over 370,000 persons were registered during the House to House registration exercise, which ended on Saturday. As the Elections Commission prepares for early elections, data from the House to House registration will be merged with data from the existing National Register. A preliminary voters list will then be prepared from the combined data, and that will allow for a claims and objections period. No timeline has been given for the start of the claims and objections period. Tomorrow's statutory meeting of the Ghana Elections Commission is expected to look at the process that will be used to merge the data as well as the issues related to the House to House registration exercise. It was the decision of the Ghana Elections Commission Chair to bring the House to House registration exercise to an early end and set in motion a plan to merge the data and prepare the preliminary voters list. The government has welcomed the chairman's decision, while the opposition is now complaining that the merger of the two data could further complicate the voters list. The hinterland region will continue to benefit from the government's development plan, especially under the Decade of Development Initiative. Speaking at the launching of Indigenous Heritage Month last evening, President David Granger said development taking place in Indigenous communities is cause for hope, especially in the field of education. Access to schools for hinterland students has been improved through the Public Education Transportation Service, PETS. 
this initiative, properly known as the Three Bs Initiative, has provided buses, boats, and bicycles to help students to attend school at Mabaruma, Main State Waka, Queenstown, Madia, Kokwani, Kumaka. Boats are transporting children, free of cost. In many of our rivers, Pomeroon, Maikoni, Kanji, Burbis, and Demerara, the public education transport service has distributed over 4,000 bicycles free, including to hinterland children. The president noted that development is about long-term progress, not a short-term process, and it involves integrated planning and implementation for education, the economy, society, and security to achieve change everywhere. Education will be a cornerstone of the decade, which will continue the task of repositioning education, which commenced four years ago. Education is now moving on the correct path. More than $170 billion have been expended on education over the past four years by this government. Expenditure on public education moved from 14.8% of the national budget in 2014 to 17% in 2017. It was noted that Indigenous Heritage Month celebrates not only the history of Ghana's Indigenous peoples, but also their destiny. Several activities will be celebrated throughout the month of September to commemorate and celebrate Ghana's Indigenous peoples and their heritage. As Ghana steps up preparations for a first oil following the arrival of the country's first oil production vessel, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana Sarah Ann Lynch is warning that all the concerns and talk about local content could possibly scare away foreign investors. Speaking over the weekend at a general meeting of the American Chamber of Commerce in Guyana, Ambassador Lynch said some recent suggestions about local content policy in Guyana may send a signal that some investors, as well as the employment and know-how benefits they bring, may not be welcomed here. As in most policy matters, such a vision requires that we avoid undermining our own objectives. For example, some recent suggestions of a local content policy in Guyana may send a signal that some investors, as well as the employment and know-how benefits they bring, may not be welcome here. At a time of increasing integration, especially in a globalized energy sector, focusing on who owns a firm could be counterproductive. Rather, the emphasis should be on whether the firms be they local, be they international, are following international best practices on critical matters such as financial transparency, environmental protection, and otherwise acting in a manner that contributes directly to Guyana's overall sustainable prosperity. The ambassador noted that it is the goal of the U.S. government to strengthen business and trade relations with Guyana so that both countries could benefit. She said investors would create more employment for the country while injecting more capital in the local economy. The Energy Department has drafted a local content policy that is now being studied by the private sector community. The private sector in Guyana has been pushing for a stronger local content policy that would ensure local businesses benefit equally from the oil sector and its offerings. Some business leaders have called for less incentives being offered to foreign investors. On the police blotter, police investigators moved into the Haslington area this morning on the east coast of Demerara after the body of a man was found in a trench in the community. The dead man has been identified as 58-year-old David Gentle of Haslington. According to the police, based on information, Gentle was last seen alive around 1.30 this morning when he left a hangout bar in the community to head home. His body was found just after 5 o'clock this morning, with multiple chop wounds to the head and other parts of the body. There has been no arrest, and investigators have been left baffled since all of the man's valuables were found at the scene. Police investigators cordoned off the area as they started their investigations this morning. The probe is ongoing tonight.
We should be proud because, as I've been on record as saying, the cost for these vessels, whether they're leasing or whether the second one we, we are likely to be purchasing, these are costs which we as Guyanese have to pay. So I know we have been seeding a lot and saying, oh, Exxon's vessel and Exxon Mobile first FPSO. But as Guyanese, we should be start recognizing that these are our monies. And so it is a Guyanese vessel pumping Guyanese fuel, which will be bringing in Guyanese revenue to help Guyanese to ultimately advance and develop. Monday and Friday to receive your call to win big. Check Facebook for participating locations and more details. Look at your fuel system, boy. High mileage and performance, boy. Fuel it up and win. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways knowing that's what being a man is all about and ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing stand strong be the one to live right across the region right now hurricane dorian appears to have caused unprecedented devastation in the bahamas the country's leader says the Category 5 storm, the second strongest Atlantic hurricane on record, remains extremely dangerous, said Prime Minister Hubert Minnis. Some 13,000 houses are feared damaged or destroyed, according to the International Red Cross. Pictures showed surging floodwaters, upturned cars, and snapped trees. Dorian is the most powerful storm to hit the Bahamas since records began and will later move dangerously close to the U.S. East Coast, according to the forecasters. It is moving with maximum sustained winds near 165 miles per hour. A life-threatening storm surge could raise water levels by as much as 23 feet in parts of Grand Bahama Island. The U.S. National Hurricane Center said that only a slight deviation in the path of the storm could bring Dorian directly over Florida's east coast, which is already expected to face life-threatening storm surges and dangerous winds over the next couple of days. A Trinidad and Tobago born man living in Maryland, USA, accused of planning an Islamic State inspired attack at a shopping and entertainment complex near Washington, was indicted last Wednesday on a terrorism related charge, five months after his arrest. A federal grand jury indicted 28 year old Rondell Henry of Germantown on a new charge of attempting to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization, ISIS. NBC4 Washington reported that Henry is a naturalized U.S. citizen who moved to the country from Trinidad and Tobago about 11 years ago. He was arrested on the 28th of March and remains detained pending trial. He was initially indicted in April and pleaded not guilty to one count of interstate transportation of a stolen vehicle. Henry allegedly stole a U-Haul van in Virginia and parked it at a national harbor. Police arrested him the next morning after they found the van and saw Henry jump over a security fence. NBC4 reported that Henry told investigators he planned to carry out an attack similar to one in which a driver ran over and killed dozens of people in France back in 2016. And finally tonight, international news. Thousands of secondary school and university students have boycotted classes in Hong Kong in the latest pro-democracy protests. Organizers say 10,000 pupils from 200 secondary schools did not turn up for the first day of the new school year. The student action comes on the same day as a call for a broad two-day strike and large rally. Protests over the weekend saw some of the worst violence in weeks between protesters and the police. On Saturday, protesters threw petrol bombs, lit fires and attacked the city's parliament building, while police used tear gas, rubber bullets, water cannons and fired live warning shots. 
Hong Kong is now entering its 14th successive week of demonstrations. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting.